I'm very proud to be in the College of Business, and on behalf of the faculty and the Board of Advisors, it's our pleasure to welcome you to the third year of the Citizen State Bank um, First Party Series. And we are so pleased to be able to feature Mandy Hendricks today. And before we get there, my job is always, always to, to introduce Dennis Bowen, who is the who is the CEO of Citizen State Bank. And he's been a real supporter of ours for years. He has a scholarship as well. And his history, as far as he, he his bank has actually been consistently recognized as one of the top 100 community banks in the country. In addition to being one of the happiest places to work in the world. If you don't know this, he actually has a system that they're checking on the on their uh, employees every week. And it's not, he says, Mark, it's not like we ask, are you happy today? But it's also just following the pulse of how people are feeling. And if there's a problem, then that means he can move in on it. Um, he worked himself up the corporate ladder in a very short period of time to become vice president, credit administration. He began his banking career as a UWL intern, where he obtained his BS in finance in 1997 followed by his MBA in 2002. In addition to his role at Citizen State Bank, he's very active in other non-for-profit ventures in the area, in addition to many um, non-profit charitable organizations. So many, in fact, we're not gonna name them, but the other thing is he's, he's gotten lauded and he's won many, many awards. Um, Dennis um, has recognized the importance of being involved um, as an undergraduate at UWL even. He started, he was very active in American Marketing Association, which we're very pleased that they are that the American Marketing Association is hosting today's event. And he was also in the Financial Management Association at UWL. He's been involved with the Silver Eagles Board of Directors. For those of you who do not know what that is, that is the CPA branded alumni association. And he takes great pride in our university and whenever possible tries to hire outstanding UWL graduates. So he, he um, I must tell you, if you've never been to Citizen State Bank, you need to go down there. And actually, Dennis is more than willing to talk to you about it today because they have an awesome chill vibe. It's not like any other bank I think you've ever been in. So you need to check it out from the music they play to the uh, decoration schemes that they use. So with no further ado, here's Dennis. again to bring one of our many successful alums back to campus, so I appreciate you coming. And I know she'll talk about her story, but one thing I did know when I was looking and doing some research on her is that prior to going into the family business, she was in pharmaceutical sales, which I don't know if she's going to touch on this, but I'm sure she learned a lot in pharmaceutical sales that she takes to this day and run her company because there's so many things that you can learn from sales. By a show of hands, I'm assuming most of the students here are marketing students, correct? How many of you are planning to go into sales by a show of hands? One person, two, three, four. Wow, oh, okay. Now I'm gonna ask another question. By a show of hands, when you hear sales, you get anxiety, you get clammy. Oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. Show of hands. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're better still there. That was me also. Some people that you know work in my bank now think, well, I was just born a salesperson. Absolutely not. I was in that same boat raising my hand and at my first job when she talked about when they said, hey Dennis, you're going to go and get some business. I got no sales training. Absolutely none. I sat there and looked at the phone. Oh my God. Oh, what is this person going to say? I don't even know what to say. I'm sweating and clamming up and I call it. It was the most awkward conversation. I just hang up. Oh my God, I can't do this. Or I got to go to a meeting that I'm not going to know anybody, but I'm expected to go talk to people. Oh my God, it's in my car. Do I really want to do this? Oh my God. Well, the light bulb went on and said, yes, I can do this. I'm committed to being very successful. And to do that, you've got to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Nothing great happens in your comfort zone. All right? And if you can be successful in sales, you'll never need another job in your life. People will be stumbling over to hire you. Okay? And it can happen. But you've got to be committed to going out of your comfort zone. And that's one thing in my company, when we hire operations IT people, if they were to go down their bank, it is what operations and IT. Every single employee in our organization goes to an eight series sales training course. Yes, they're not selling money, not selling new accounts, but sales is so wide, and in terms of how you touch every customer, how you communicate. And especially in this day and age when you have so much text and email, if you can communicate, present yourself, sell yourself, sell your company, 
sell a product possibly, you will be very, very successful. And the reason I bring that up is we have an opportunity after this for you to push yourself out of your comfort zone. A little social gathering afterwards. You might know some people in here, but the people you don't know. And you never know who's going to open up that next door. It could be me, it could be Jay, it could be anybody. Go out of your comfort zone and stumble and fall on your face. Because you learn more from your mistakes than you do your successes. All right? I've had a lot of awkward conversations in my career. But I wouldn't be where I am right now if I wasn't committed to being pushed out of my comfort zone. And again, in the sales training that I talked about with my employees, I've had people threaten to quit. They're tearing up, having anxiety attacks. But when they finish it and they say, wow, I have to roll. And it's a completely different person. And that's why our culture is so different because we have those high standards and everybody's committed to going out of their comfort zone. So just think about that. Hopefully you're just not like, I gotta get the heck out of here so I can go on Friday. I understand that. <laughs> but if you're committed about why you're really at this university to network and make something of yourself, you'll stick around for a few minutes and meet some new people. All right? So with that, I'll turn it over to Mandy and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks for coming. You're more welcome. Hello, is this, is this on? Am I good? Am I good? Yes? Yeah? Um, well, thank you for having me. I can say that I never in a million years thought I would be back here um, speaking to, to, my, um, my, to my alums. So um, just a little bit about myself. I guess I don't know um, if I have anything super exciting to share with you, um, but I'll sure as heck try. I should turn this on. That would help. Um, so I graduated high school um, from Berlin in the year 2000. Um, I was valedictorian of my high school class. Um, because of taking college credits your senior year, um, it pushed my GPA to like a 4.8, which is kind of ridiculous and probably um, maybe not that realistic. Um, so it worked out that I got all the scholarship money, but I didn't have to give the speech at graduation, so that worked out really great. Um, when I, um, after high school, I um, got my bartending license. Um, so I bartended and I drove a Bev cart on a golf course. And you're thinking like, why is that relevant? We don't, we don't need to go that far back, Mandy. Um, I think those, that just going into that career, well, it's not career, the job, um, not only did I make a boatload of money for the summer, which is awesome, um, I, what Dennis was just talking about, you learn to talk to people that you don't know, you maybe don't want to talk to, um, but you have the opportunity to go out of your comfort zone, sell them something, talk to them, get to know them, um, and that actually ironically led to um, two kind of relationships that um, I was able to come to lacrosse with. I, in talking with people, it's like, oh, where are you going to school in the fall? And I say lacrosse. Um, one, of the, one of the guys that was golfing, it was Dr. Freeman. He um, taught here back in the day. Um, he was in the physical education. I think he was uh, involved in wrestling. Um, so when I came to school, I already kind of had like, like, a, like a friend, you know, somebody that I knew that I could go to. I wasn't totally alone. Um, he uh, welcomed my mom and dad. Um, he took them golfing, you know, came up for dinner. Um, so that was just one, um, one person that, you know, just by a bartending, you know, Bevcart gig, I was able to, to learn um, something. I also met another guy who was like, oh, I'm from lacrosse, you know, blah, 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 got to know him, kind of end of story. He called, um, when I was here, I lived in Laux. Um, he called and said, hey, he's like, I'm going to the girls' basketball game, you should come. And at first I was like, weird. But I took my, one of my dorm mates and I said, hey, I got to go meet this guy at this basketball game. Um, and he handed me a $500 scholarship. And he's like, you know, we just, we like to have, you know, good people here at the school. And, you know, we really like what you're all about. So again, like, talk to people, like, get to know people. You never know what you're going to learn, who you're going to meet, um, you know, where your uh, paths will cross um, in the future. So when I was here, you know, to date myself, that was my cell phone. Um, I, I graduated, um, I came here in 2000. Um, cell phones were not, I mean, I think everybody maybe had a cell phone. Definitely no smartphones. Um, computers were, I mean, we had computers. I'm not that old. Um, not everybody had one in their dorm room. Certainly not everybody had a laptop. There was no such thing as a tablet, a notebook, or whatever. 
I don't know. I don't know if there are still computer labs on campus, but that's where you had to go to like write a paper and do some research. Um, social media was Third Street, um, <laughs> and we did. I don't think. I don't think Wi-Fi was created, and there was no Amazon. So just picture life with no Amazon. Um, so I came here. Um, I was kind of on a fast track. Um, I wanted to get out into the. To the workforce and make money. Um, so I was a marketing student. Um, I worked really closely with um, Joe Chilson and Dr. Brokaw. Um, they were kind of my people. Um, so I leaned on them a lot. And I think with maybe nowadays you guys have email, you have texting, you have cell phones, you have whatever. So I don't know how much time you pester your, your um, professors and the faculty and the staff, but take the time to get to know them. Take the time to actually talk to them. Um, don't just hide behind emails when you're having conversations. If you're having a problem with a class, you're having a problem with a subject, a whatever, um, I don't think you'll come out further behind if you actually went into their office and made the effort to say like, hey, I really don't get this, or hey, I can't get past this, you know, whatever. So, um, so get out from behind the computers, get out from behind technology, and, and talk to people. You, you will never regret having a conversation with somebody. Um, so, okay, so while I was here, um, I, bet bar I bartended again. Um, at one point, I had like five part-time jobs. Um, the bar that I worked at in Onalaska, his wife owned a hair salon, so I answered the phone and swept up hair on Saturday mornings. Um, I worked at American Marine when it was out on um, Pettibone or whatever that's called, out that direction. Um, I, I served at the Bikini Yacht Club, which I don't... My, my, my mom and dad are here. They maybe not even don't even know that I had that job. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, like, you know, get yourself out there, make some money. Um, I had an internship at Gunderson Lutheran in the marketing department. I wrote their newsletters and did some other things. Um, so then, uh, what's my next slide here? So, yeah, so, uh, you know, preparing for graduation. Um, in Dr. Brokaw's, um, what is it called? The final marketing capstone project. Okay. Um, so I, um, so in one of Chilson's classes, um, there was a pharmaceutical rep that came in and he talked about the job. He talked about, you know, all the money, all the great, you know, whatever. And I thought, that's the job that I'm going to get. Like it, it paid a lot. I wanted to do sales. Um, and so I thought I could sell drugs. Like how, you know, how awesome would that be? So, <laughs> No, they don't really hire people with no experience, so I used my final marketing project um, to fully research the job itself and the industry itself. So on the, on the end of it, I had like a 40-page paper, you maybe are done reading it yet, um, that just fully went through the whole project um, because I needed to have something to go to like these big pharma companies and say like, hey, look, I really want to work here. I really, you know, I think I can do the job. I know what it's about. So, um, so that's what I did. Um, when I graduated, the average marketing student, I think, earned like $23,000 or something. And I thought, no way in hell am I going to be able to survive on that. So my goal was to get a job that was at least double that. So I landed a job um, with Tap Pharmaceuticals. Um, and my starting salary, I think, was like 465. Um, and I got a company car and an expense account, and so like, life was made. I was, you know, I was good. So, um, one horror story that I'll share with you before I obviously got hired with Tap, I interviewed with Pfizer, and I thought Pfizer was like the the company to work for, like they're you know the top of the top. Um, so I went down to Madison and sat in a room with like these five business suits. And they drilled me for like an hour and a half. And I sold like the pencil, I sold whatever, myself. And it was pure hell. And I don't think I cried in the interview, but when I got out to my car, I lost it. And I thought, there is no way I'm going to work for that company. So <clears throat> when you're um, going out to your jobs and you're looking for people that you want to work for, you know, culture is a big thing. I mean, like, I just felt like if those five suits is who I had to deal with on a daily basis, like, was the money really going to be worth it? So, um, so I did find a job with TAP, and they're awesome. Um, 
So I, uh, I worked for them for four years. The biggest drug that I sold was Prevacid for um, acid reflux. Um, one of my teammates, Rod Hill, he's here. He was in the La Crosse territory. I wasn't lucky enough um, to find a job here in La Crosse. Um, but I moved to Stevens Point. I sold pharma for four years. I covered like central Wisconsin. Um, while I was working for pharma, um, I started my MBA through UW Oshkosh because they, so I was living in Stevens Point, they offered classes in Point and in um, Oshkosh, and so my territory was Oshkosh, so I could very easily work that in um, uh, with, my, with my sales routing. Um, so as, uh, as things went on with pharma, I mean, access was getting really hard. Um, clinics stopped taking samples. I mean, there was just not a lot that I, was, I felt like I was accomplishing. Um, there was a doctor in Wausau that was like the big target. Everybody had to go talk to Dr. Freeman. If you got her to write your drug, like you, you know, you were made. And so she had like a six month waiting list to get on to, you know, come and bring her lunch. She had a very small office. Um, she, when you finally did get to talk to her, um, she would brush her teeth while you were there. She would floss her teeth while she's talking to you. She would make no eye contact and she would make you feel like, like, worthless and it's you know I was like eh, I don't know. okay fine so I got this lunch finally got on the calendar I called the the delivery service that was gonna um, deliver the lunch to her office and I said hey this is Mandy with tap and um, I have the Freeman lunch today and they're like okay I said because you have to give them the credit card and they're like it's two hundred and eighty seven dollars I'm like no I'm like this is Dr. Freeman like it's like a five-person office and they're like yep that's that's the bill and I was like you know what I'm done. I said, cancel lunch. I'm not going. Um, so I, I was, so she would order lunch for her and her staff, and then she'd order dinner for herself and her family. Um, d she was just, she was like, everything that is wrong with selling drugs, she was it. So, um, so that was it. I called, um, I called my manager. I put in my notice, and I said, I'm done. Like this, this is not for me. So, like any kid. Um, you call your parents <laughs> and I said you know hey I just put in my resignation and so um, so we're a family business my mom and dad started our company um, in 84 when I was three um, so my mom dispatched trucks from our living room dad drove trucks at you know during the day worked on them himself so um, I when I graduated um, college there was no way I was going to go back to the family business. That didn't seem very exciting. Um, and it, trucking certainly did not seem glamorous. Um, so I um, finally went back. And so we kind of hashed it out with what I was going to get paid, what I was going to do, how it was going to work. Um, and then I guess we basically, my dad and I made the agreement, like I could quit if I didn't like it, um, or he could fire me if I wasn't any good. So um, my final, um, final year with TAP, um, I think I was at like $130,000. Um, I left, um, and for over half less, um, I joined the family business, and I absolutely would never do it <coughs> differently. So to tell you a little bit about Flash, this is where it gets super exciting. Um, so this is what the majority of our trucks look like. We're a dry bulk carrier. Um, we haul mostly sand to like the foundry industry. Um, we haul lime to like paper mills, water treatment plants, um, municipalities. Um, sand they use in like the cast, they make the castings with the sand. Um, lime they use to make, um, makes what's, that's what makes paper white. Um, and then uh, they use it in like emissions to clean, um, you know, the air that's coming out of their facility. Um, this is just another um, couple pictures. The one on the top is a sleeper. Most of our fleet is day cab, so our drivers are home every night. That is one of our, um, kind of one of our claims to why you should come work at Flash, because you're home every night. Um, just different trailers. Um, aside from trucking, um, the one on the bottom is a Michigan trailer. That's just because in Michigan you can haul much heavier loads than what you can haul like in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Um, and on the top, that's called transloading. So we um, not only will go to like a sand plant or a lime plant, um, we will either put material in or take material out of rail cars. So that's 
another service that we offer. On the top, that is um, without the conveyor. That truck just pulls up alongside that, um, that rail car and hooks up with a hose and either vacuums it out or they pressurize and it moves with the air. And the bottom is just a picture of one of our trucks at a dirty foundry. Um, these little things on the bottom here, those are actually, we call them pigs. They're really big bulk storage tanks. That holds the equivalent, equivalent of eight loads of what our normal trucks can haul. So we, um, we have a leasing company that has a bunch of equipment in it. Um, we lease out these pigs um, to like a highway paving project or somebody that is maybe um, putting up a new silo and so they need something to store the material in. So that's what um, those are for. We do um, about 90% of all of our own maintenance. Um, we feel like we can do it cheaper and better. Um, so f on the flash side of things, um, we have a terminal in Green Lake. That's where corporate is. That's our largest um, truck terminal. Um, and then we have one in Green Bay. We are in LaSalle, Illinois, which is about an hour south of Rockford. Um, and then Tell City, Indiana, which is the very southern tip of Indiana. And now we're in Texas. So this is just a picture of one of our shops. Um, this is Chris, um, well, I call him Sally because I have since I was like six. Um, he's been with us for 25 years, um, so this is him working on one of our trucks. Um, this is actually my Uncle Doug because, um, you know, we're a family business. He heads up all of our maintenance, um, but the picture here is what I'm showing is this laptop is hooked up to this tr truck because trucks nowadays are just like giant computers rolling down the road. So they hook up these laptops and they can um, pull all the diagnostics and um, figure out what's going on with the trucks and what's wrong and what the codes are. And um, we work very closely with like Mac and Volvo, whoever we bought buy our trucks from um, on software. So pretty much they are just big computers. Um, we have one wash bay, which is in Green Lake. Uh, we used to have a food division, so we hauled liquid chocolate and sugar and flour, and um, we hauled uh, brewer's malt to like the brewery um, here in town. Um, so this tank wash facility is a state-of-the-art tank wash facility, um, and that was built with our new office because we had the food division at that time. Um, so I mentioned we have some equipment. Mascouten Heights Leasing Company is just kind of a of uh, shell company for us. That's where all of our equipment is held. Um, so we have a fleet of about a thousand rail cars. Um, these are some of our own cars, the MHLX, that's the, that's the number, the marking on the car. X at the end, that means it's a private car, just in case you want to ever know that. Um, so we have, yeah, like I said, about a thousand um, rail cars that we um, lease out to mostly the oil and gas industries um, that are moving sand. Um, so there's always a lot of room to make um, challenges into some opportunities. Um, we're in trucking. It's no secret. It's very male dominated. Um, I am not male. So there we go. That's one big challenge that um, I've, I wouldn't, I, I guess I wouldn't say it was a, it's been a bad thing. Um, I think I've opened a lot of doors that maybe my dad necessarily couldn't be just because I was female. Um, I think I think there is one thing to walk into a foundry and be, you know, some blonde. Um, I typically don't wear these to the foundry. So if I could put on a pair of jeans and a hard hat um, and I feel like I know enough, um, I think once I start talking, um, they, they know that I'm not just some ponytail that's here to sell them some trucking. So um, I think whatever job you go into, just um, be very confident in what you know. Um, obviously do your homework. I mean, don't, you can't, can't pretend. Um, but my dad will always say that you, <coughs> you definitely know more than you think you do. Um, so that's been one of the challenges that I've been able to make into an opportunity. Uh, we've gotten very involved in the American Foundry Society, um, the local chapter um, by us in the like northeast Wisconsin area. Um, as we transitioned from my dad leading the company to myself, um, I've stepped into the AFS chapter. I'm now on their executive committee. I serve as the secretary, so I'm running the chairs there. Um, and that is, um, you know, a monthly meeting with, like, myself, maybe one other gal, and, like, all men, um, because it is Foundry, and it's all the Foundry guys. But it's been an opportunity for me to get to know these guys and, and show that I genuinely care about the job, I genuinely care about the industry, and it's not working. What? Okay. Um, again, that is just another avenue for networking. So networking and talking to people, you will never, um, you will never regret. 
Um, we are a family business, and that is something that uh, we've taken to our customers, and I think that s says a lot about us. Um, a lot of the customers that we have now um, were with my mom and dad when they started, so um, like a lot of our customers, they've watched me grow up. Uh, you know, they're retiring as my dad's retiring, and so um, it's just been a nice relationship with us. Um, like Wapaka Foundry is the largest foundry group in the world, or maybe North America. Um, they are our biggest customer. We are in the top five of their suppliers. So, you know, we're just like a little trucking company, but we're actually, you know, dealing with some pretty big companies. And um, I think family business, um, our model, and, and being able to run a business on, like, family values has definitely um, been a good opportunity for us. Um, succession planning is, is never easy, and it's sometimes uncomfortable. Um, we got involved with the Wisconsin Family Business Forum, which is through University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Um, I also sat on their board. Um, we used them to work through the succession and figure out, you know, how do things transition from my dad to me. And, you know, they talk a lot about, um, you know, working in the business versus on the business and, and why it's important to do both. And, um, you know, getting the right people on the bus and what happens if somebody gets hit by the bus. Um, in our case, like my dad and I, we have really bad memories, so sometimes it's like, what if we forget to get on the bus? So um, it's been very good, and our succession plan is mostly complete. Um, my, I'll, you'll, I'll tell you a little bit more, um, but my dad is retired once, started a new business, and so he might, he might retire again someday. But So I, we have successioned um, into me leading um, the, the trucking company um, and the grocery store, because we have one of those two. Um, in 2009, this is another business we currently have, uh, Transload Solutions. Um, when I talked about transloading before, uh, Transload Solutions, right now it exists just out east. Um, we, uh, people send us rail cars, we empty the sand, we put it into storage, other people's trucks come, pick it up, and it goes to the oil and gas, the, the well sites um, for fracking. Um, so in 2009, we unloaded about 10 cars a week, um, which is about 1,000 tons of sand. Um, in 2013, we signed a 20-year contract with the largest sand supplier in the world. Um, since then, we've put in about $40 million of a capital investment. This is a picture of Benwood at night, which is just kind of a cool picture if you could see it. Um, today, we unload about 300 cars a week. We're the single largest transload in the Marcellus and Utica shale. Um, shale plays are kind of the areas or regions that they use um, when they talk about um, where oil and gas is located. Um, so that's out east, um, and we're ranked in the top five in the U.S. This is just a picture of a uh, rail car coming in. It drives over these pits, the sand falls out, and it goes up into these big silos. So in West Virginia, we have 28,000 tons of storage, um, 35,000 feet of track. We can load a truck in six minutes, um, and we load about 125 trucks a day. Um, when I came back to the family business and kind of was back home, um, I wanted to get involved in the community. That's a big part of what our family is about and um, what my parents have always, you know, preached to us about giving back. So I got involved with the Boys and Girls Club of the Tri-County area. We were part of the Oshkosh Boys and Girls Club. We were housed in this old school in Berlin. Um, I, I joined in like 2009, I think. Um, shortly thereafter, we had some changeover, and the board was kind of shrinking and needed new leadership, so I raised my hand. Um, so I started as secretary. I ran the chairs for that. Um, when I was in the president's position, we started a capital campaign to build a brand new building. Um, so it ended up being a $4 million campaign um, to build the building and then a $2 million endowment. So we were tasked with raising $6 million. Um, Boys and Girls Club National said that we had to um, raise all the money before we could erect the building. Um, I, they, Oshkosh approached me about staying on as the president for another two years, um, just to maintain the consistency of our board and of the, of the campaigning. Um, so we were able to do that. That is the new building <coughs> that sits um, on the corner of, um, in Berlin. Um, so we raised all the money. We have a $2 million endowment, um, and we just completed our own charter. So. Boys and Girls Club nationally, is their model is to um, consolidate and bring all these little clubs and satellite clubs under one bigger umbrella. Um, we have 
convinced them that it made sense for our club to, do, to go the opposite direction. So we actually broke out from under Oshkosh, and we ha now have our own charter. So we went from serving from, in my time with the club, um, about 40 kids a day. We're like at 120 kids a day that come through there. 57% um, I think of the Berlin population is free and reduced lunch. So um, it's definitely needed and it's a huge um, asset for the community. So we now have um, showers and a full gym, um, a teen center. This is a picture of the teen center down here. Um, so that um, these kids can have a place to go and we can really you know, fulfill the mission of improving those lives of those kids and those families. So in 2010, um, another company that uh, we had started, um, my dad was the majority owner. We had a minority owner that he owned another sand plant that we actually haul out of. Um, he, they worked together for a short amount of time and then he um, was bought out. So it became the sole ownership um, for us. Um, it was 500 acres um, in Taylor, Wisconsin, not far from here. Um, 35 years of known sand reserves. This is a sand, this is a sand mine. Um, so we would pull the sand out of the ground, we would process it, wash it, dry it, um, reclaim the land that it came out of, make it better than what we started, um, load it into rail cars, and then that sand also goes to the oil and gas industry. By 2012, we were in full production. Um, in 2014, we were approached um, by another large company to buy it, and um, I think my dad has a crystal ball because right after he sold it, the market tanked. So. Um, that worked well for all of us. Um, in 2012, I married Noah. Maybe some of you met him. He's also a UWL alum. <coughs> um, in 2014, um, these are our kids. <laughs> so Finn on the left, he is our son. He's four. Um, Rory is two and a half, going on 20. Um, this is the, you know, the part of life that just you know, becomes very real. People don't tell you how real um, life can get. <coughs> um, so my son was born with a, a birth defect. He has an underdeveloped left hand, which uh, you can't see in this picture. Um, so one of those, you know, make, uh, capitalize your opportunity. Um, we, when he was born, obviously we were like, what do we do? This is crazy. Why me? You know, you could choose to be very upset. You can be choose to be very mad. Um, we were like, okay, this is it. It's clearly not changing. Um, so we went to Milwaukee. We went to Chicago um, to see some doctors and figure out what do we do. Um, and so one doctor was like, oh, this will be super easy. We'll just take some of his toes off. We'll make them into fingers and then it'll be great. And I'm like, well, what happens if that doesn't work? And they're like, well, then we just take all the fingers off and then, you know, sorry. Like, that sounds like a horrible approach. So we went to Shriners, and they were like, oh, um, you know what? This is probably the best he's ever going to be. So you know, you should just thank your lucky stars and you know, move on with life. So uh, here I am with like, the two most polar um, you know, decisions or opinions. And so there's a project out there. I'll give a little plug. It's called the Lucky Fin Project. Um, not, because, not named after my son. It's Nemo, because he has one small fin. So the Lucky Fin Project is for um, limb difference awareness. And so I thank you to social media. I found um, on Lucky Fin, they kept talking about this doctor sites. And so um, an opportunity that we have, my dad has a private plane. So um, I said, I got to go to Cleveland. I got to go talk to this doctor. I got to figure out, like, I just got to talk to him. Like, who knows? You, you know, you just, you just never know. So um, we jet set it out to Cleveland with Finn. Um, so at this time, he's like 14 months old. And so we met Dr. Bill, is his name. Um, Dr. Seitz, we call him Dr. Bill. Um, we met his surgical team, and he looked at Finn and was like, oh, he's like, th I, I know exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take some bones, not the whole toe take some bones out of his toes, we're going to you know, build up his hand, we're going to shift some things around, um, took one of the little nubs off, um, and so he reconstructed Finn's hand um, in five surgeries. Um, and so you know, we were lucky enough to be able to fly to Cleveland back and forth. Um, Finn also now wants to be a pilot. Um, and so we, you know, that's you know, one of those capitalize your opportunities. I mean, it's not, sometimes you just have to take advantage of uh, the good things put in front of you. And so, um, so yeah, so, so that's just a little like personal, you know, you can, you know, 
whine and sulk and be mad, or you can just take the good with the bad and appreciate all that you have. And so um, he is a pretty good tennis player. He took first place uh, in golf at his summer camp. Um, and now he's really big into karate. So um, he, it's, it's working. And, and that surgery, those surgeries paid off. Um, not to not talk about Rory, because she is uh, perfect in and of itself. If we could just get her to poop on the potty and not be such a meanie, we would be like golden. So, um, in 2016, um, there's a grocery store in Green Lake um, that was going to close. It was owned by the local doctor, not a businessman. Um, my dad grew up in Green Lake, and he did not want the town to go without a grocery store. And so he thought, well, we should buy it because we're in trucking. This makes sense. <laughs> so we, he bought the store in uh, 2016. It was a 13,000 square foot store. Um, we hired a manager because we don't know anything about groceries. Um, so we hired a manager. We filled the shelves back up because it was um, pretty bare. Um, kind of reintroduced um, the store to the, to the community, and we rebranded it. Um, in the expansion, we went from 13,000 feet to 26,000 feet, so we did a three-wall push-out. We never really closed the store. We had no interruption in business. Um, like I said, we rebranded it. We added a meat service case. We have a smokehouse. We expanded the deli. We have a full scratch bakery, um, a cafe, a drive through for coffee. Um, and so this is what the store looked like when we bought it. This was kind of the branding. Um, this is what it looks like now. So we rebranded everything and painted. Um, that's a shot of the deli looking down the meat cases at the end. And then I have a fun little video, but I got to go this way because my computer doesn't work. You hear it? So this was a video that, um, actually our vice president, his son has a, he made it, that's his business. Crossroads. Um, in there, uh, Beth, our marketing manager, she mentioned this roundup program. So that's just when you go and you check out and they say, would you like to round up to the next dollar? So, so far we've given like almost $30,000 back to the local community, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so, so, that, so that's everything I can tell you about groceries. Um, the la I think this is the last of our companies that we own. Um, to 2016, we um, took us to Texas. <coughs> this is Texas Frack. 
Uh, it's very similar to Taylor Freck, except it's in Texas. Um, so we are in northern Texas, just south of Oklahoma City. This is another sand plant. Um, this is sand that we're mining and processing for the oil and gas industry. Um, so they use the sand um, to fracture the wells and for oil and gas production. Um, so like I said, we bought that in 2016. It's 1,800 acres. Um, there's 90 years of proven sand reserves there. Um, the reclamation there is um, pretty extensive because the, the ground and the water um, is, is it's just really poor. It's in kind of poor condition. And so what we've been able to do is really clean up the water, clean up the land, plant trees, plant grass. Um, so the water that's coming off of our property is now cleaner than what the water that it would ever go into. It's a closed loop system. I'll show you a picture. Um, so the, sand, or the water just kind of like stays within the whole system um, just for water preservation. Um, we are now building another sand plant in South Texas. Um, it's called South Texas Frack. Um, and that will be down by the San Antonio area. That's 1,700 acres and 50 years of proven sand reserves. This is an aerial shot of Texas Frack. So this is a holding pond right there. So that's all part of the closed system. This part up here, that is where um, the sand is all mined. And then it's fed into the wash plant here. And then it travels this conveyor. It's like a third of a mile, half of a mile long. Um, and then this horseshoe right here, it's empty now, but that's where all the sand falls um, and, and falls into a stockpile. Um, and then feeds, where am I? So then the sand feeds into the dry plant right here and then goes into these silos. So the trucks come in, they loop around, they drive through these silos, they load right on a scale and they're out of there in like 20 minutes. <coughs> so that's all of our companies. Um, when when you're lucky enough to have a company and have employees, um, you also have to take the not so good because um, turns out employees are not always happy and they're not always seeing eye to eye with you. Um, so that, that is always kind of a constant opportunity. Um, the approach that I've taken since joining the family business, um, so I had to work for somebody else. So I know what it's like to be an employee. I know what it's like to be on the other side of that table when you're getting interviewed or drilled or scolded or reprimanded um, or praised or whatever. And so um, I think that's a, a plus that I add to, to the family business because my mom and dad have been doing this like their whole life. So they started with three trucks. I joined the company when we had like 100. So, um, so that's been a different um, viewpoint, I think, that I've been able to bring um, to the family business. Um, right now, there's a driver and just all of uh, just an entire employee shortage. Um, so we're now looking at ways that how are we going to recruit drivers? I mean, we used to say, you're local, you're home every day. Um, you know, so we actually just met this week. We're going to try some crazy wage increases in one location of ours and see if it works. And if we can keep our drivers and we can attract new ones. Because um, right now, our service is not great. And that's, that's a struggle for us, because that's, that's how we got to where we are. That's how you stay in trucking for 40 years. And so for us um, to be able to go to uh, our customers and say, like, look, we know we're not responding as fast as you need. And we know that our service is not great. And we know that we have to not bring a load because the driver just doesn't show up. Um, so we are going to try a crazy wage hike um, down in one of our locations. Um, the starting salary for a driver is going to be $80,000. So that's a far cry from 23.5 when I graduated from here for marketing. Um, so this is a $25 CDL license that somebody can go get um, and make $80,000 a year. But they have to show up. They have to be part of the team. They have to do what we ask. They have to you know, not give the flack. And hopefully that will create kind of a, a pool for me to choose from so that when the guy says, you know what, I don't want to go to Ohio overnight, and it's like, OK, well, then I'm just going to find somebody else that will. And hopefully that improves our employee base then I need to go to the customers and I need to have them agree to higher rates. And if they don't agree to paying for these new wages, then that's a whole different conversation that we're going to have to have. And, and maybe you know, that, that will be um, the start of what trucking does differently for us and what our company maybe looks a little different. Um, there's lawsuits. Um, one that we were just talking about this week, um, there was a, a driver that we had. And he was only with us for like two months 
did a ton of damage, like thousands and thousands of dollars of damage. And so we brought him into Green Lake, and he met with HR, and we were going to fire him because he was, I mean, expensive, and he was dangerous. And so in the conversation that he's having with our HR director, he got really mad, and he threw the HR director up against the wall. So then we fired him for assaulting the HR director because that seemed like the logical thing to do. Well, he was, I think, Puerto Rican. And so he filed a lawsuit against us because we discriminated against him because he was Puerto Rican. We didn't fire him for damaging equipment like we do to other employees. We fired him for something else. So um, two, million, two million dollars later, um, we, uh, you know, he enjoyed our money for a lot of years. So um, shit happens, and it's not great. Um, there's also accidents, and I. These are never fun when they happen, but I was going back through pictures. Um, so this is what a dump trailer looks like when it's really windy in Taylor, Wisconsin, and it tips over. Um, that is supposed to be on the ground, just <laughs> FYI. So that's a truck that tipped over. This is what happens when a driver, this is a semi truck, right? Where am I? This is the fender of a, of a semi truck. That is uh, one of our company vehicles. So that's what happens if you cut the corner too close. This just happened on Sunday night in Illinois. Um, this guy back here um, ran. So this truck was coming down the road in this direction. And that guy ran a stop sign. And he smashed that back passenger side of his truck. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. Um, but yeah, so this truck had to get towed away. And that's another load that didn't happen. And, um, we just put um, a new engine in this truck two weeks ago. So that's more pictures of that, um, that fun day. So th this is not, it's, it's not great. But, so, um, I still can't believe that we got this phone call. So this driver um, was in a hurry. And so he was going to a sand plant. And in front of the sand plant along the driveway, there's um, the CN rail. Uh, main line runs right past the sand plant. I don't know if you've seen a train going at full speed, but it's pretty fast. And so this, um, this driver approached the tracks. And you know those arms that come down? They're down for a reason. Well, he was in a hurry, and so he snaked through them. He managed to get the, the cab and himself through um, just in time for the CN train, fully loaded, going full speed, to smash into our trailer detach it from the truck, pushed that trailer fully loaded with sand, so that's 80,000 pounds, um, down the railroad, or not, yeah, 50,000 pounds, down the railroad track over a mile before it could stop. Not a single grain of sand fell out of that trailer, but the entire, so this is the bottom of the trailer. Like, there were tires and stuff here, and this is piping. And so that trailer, um, yeah, that took a ride down the railroad tracks um, on the front of a, of a train. Um, so what do I have for time? Should I stop? Should I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. How about three more minutes? Okay, so I'll talk real quickly about technology um, as one of our competitive advantages. Um, this is a live shot. Well, it was a screenshot. But all those blue dots, that shows where all of our trucks are. Our computers are all, um, are all computerized. Or our trucks are all computerized. Um, so we can zone in, like I can tell you at this point in time, this truck, this little blue guy right here, truck 191, he was, the key was in the ignition, he's going 63 miles an hour, he was heading north um, on County Road H in Del Tuno, Wisconsin, kind of by Wisconsin Dells. Um, this is Wapaka Foundry in southern Indiana. This is our truck right here. He's parked outside the guard shack. Um, so that is, you know, just how technology kind of drives our business. Um, we do a lot of inventory management for our customers. So foundries use a lot of sand. Foundries um, make uh, castings for like drums on vehicles and a uh, lot, of, lot of different parts. So they use a lot of sand. So we monitor a lot of foundries' um, inventories, and we just basically keep them full. So we watch their levels all day long. This is updated like every minute or two. Um, so this. Uh, the majority of one here, this is all, this is five of, Wisconsin, of Wapaka Foundry's plants. We monitor all those different tanks and we just send trucks as loads will fit. And this is a new one that we just started doing. This is in Iron Mountain, Michigan, that we monitor their tanks. Um, that's another video I can speak. So just some corporate facts about us right now, currently. 
We have 300 employees. In total, since um, my folks started the business, we've had just over 1,700 employees. If you figure that out, our turnover is really, really low, um, considering all the companies we have. Um, our annual payroll is about $11.1 .1 million, so that is about $3.3 .3 million in taxes that comes out of that. Um, we spend $150,000 a week um, on fuel. We deliver about 650 loads a week. We travel 8 million miles a year. Um, this year we're projected to have about $75 million in revenue, um, which translates to about $300 million of an economic impact because we buy trucks, those, we buy a Mack truck, Mack pays those people, they, you know, grocery shop, blah, 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 it, you know, spills into the economy. So, um, and we've contributed about $4 million in donations. Two million of that is just since 2014 um, to that Boys and Girls Club I was telling you about. Um, so we're all about family, we're all about value added, um, we're all about the customers. We run very lean, we wear a lot of hats, which is why I tell you that I run a trucking company, I run a grocery store, um, we have transloading, you know. So we um, house everything in Green Lake. Um, our corporate office is only about 15 people. Um, we have managers on site, you know, in Texas and whatnot, but we run pretty lean, but it's been a very successful model for, um, for us. So. Um, instead of duplicating HR and payroll and AP and AR and whatever for Texas Frack and for Crossroads and Flash and whatever, we house all that. So those people do the same function for a lot of different companies. Um, we use a lot of common sense. Um, we're very philanthropic. We have a lot of fun. Um, personally, so I'll just tell you that um, networking is so key and you, it, it, you just never know what door it's going to open for you. Um, I cannot stress enough how important it is to talk to people. Um, I've been uh, in Dennis's shoes where you sit in the car. Um, Susan, I think you could relate to this. Rod, you could relate to this. You sit in that doctor's office parking lot and you're like, I do not want to go in there. I do not. But any sales call that you make, any person that you talk to that you physically visit, pick up the phone, whatever the case may be, you will never regret it. You will never hang up the phone and be like, oh, I wish I would not have called them. So. Get out from behind the email, get out from behind your text messaging, because that is what's going to set you apart when you go into these b interviews, and God forbid you have to sit with those five suits that I had to um, a long time ago, but, um, and get to know your professors and talk to them, and, and like I said, just, you know, don't, don't hide behind email, because it will pay dividends that you, you just, trust me. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, I guess I skipped a slide. So, um, I guess, yeah, so surround yourself with really good people. Um, trust that you know more than you think you do. Um, if you screw up, own it. Um, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes as long as you do something with it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so one of the pieces of, pieces of advice I got, I think it was through the Family Business Forum, that just because you woke up on third base doesn't mean you hit a triple. So remember where you came from, um, stay humble. Um, any questions? Now that I've totally gone over time, I'm sorry. Three questions. Three questions. Okay. Dean says I get three questions. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, do you wish you would have gone into the family business right away, or are you glad that you got experience somewhere else first? I, I think at first, I mean, I don't know what my dad will say in the back. Um, I think at first it was, like, shocking that I maybe wasn't going to come back. Um, but I think had I joined the family business like straight away, I would have learned everything how my dad does exactly the way he does it. And I probably would not know how to think for myself or just have like a different opinion. Um, so, I mean, the joys of family business, I mean, you, you work with your mom and dad. I have sisters that work, I have a brother that works there, uncles, cousins, whatever. Um, you know, we have very differing opinions and my dad and I have very much the same personality. So we have gone toe to toe you know, screaming matches, and it's like, this is terrible, you know, whatever, and then, like, on the way out, it's like, yeah, your mom and I are putting chicken on the grill, are you coming over for dinner? And it's like, mm, sure, you know. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really good, to, if you do have a family business, to get outside and get some different experience, because then you just learn to think differently. I mean, right, wrong, or otherwise, but then you're not such a mold. I mean, there is no training manual that says, here's how you run Flash, so, I mean, I sat in his office for years. I mean, just listening to him talk on the phone, reading his emails, j this, in conversations, he and my uncle are talking about real, you know, equipment, t 
lingo that I have no idea what they're talking about. And so I just would interrupt and be like, oh, uh, what are you saying? And so, um, but yeah, so no, I would, would not do that differently. I think it's really important. Yeah? Uh, how are you able to uh, divide your time up against different projects? Well, I fall really behind on a lot of things. Um, no, I mean, I guess you just try to stay as organized as possible. And I mean, it just sometimes comes down to like, I make a to-do list. And it's like, just get through, you know, what's really important, what's really time sensitive. Um, you know, I take a lot of work home. I spend a lot of time working, you know, outside of like eight to five. Um, I get up really early before my kids and my husband are up because that's like the most productive two hours of my day. And then they get up and, you know, life unravels and then they go to bed and I can, you know, catch up at night and whatever. But um, it is, it's hard to balance, but I mean, the more you put in, the more you get out. Um, I think that's maybe a dying philosophy um, with like new generations. Um, but, you know, hard work will, will never leave you short. I mean, so, um, but yeah, sometimes I do fall behind on, like I go from talking about rotisserie chickens to foundry sand like in minutes and sometimes it's really hard to keep track of. Yeah? So I gave your career really different business. I just like with the sand and then the grocery store and then et cetera, et cetera, like the record company. So like what do you become like different very, very different areas? So what do you look for when you're looking like acquire that next company? Like what quality is it? Well, a lot, other than the grocery store, every, all of our businesses are pretty related. So we haul a lot of sand. So that kind of got us into like the oil and gas and we transload other products. So that got us into transloading. So we, I think when we expand our businesses, we, there's some similarities somewhere other than the grocery store. That is by far very, very different. Um, but we've been able to, um, execute a lot of our strategies with the grocery store that we do elsewhere because um, really it just comes down to basic business principles like sell it for more than it costs and you should be good so that's something we're trying to figure out right now um, but yeah I guess yeah All right. okay I'm Yay. done All right. So we get to continue the conversation, there are three questions, but that doesn't mean it has to be limited to that. Uh, because of the generosity of Dennis Vogel, we get the first drink, alcoholic or non, is on Dennis, so we very much appreciate his graciousness to support that. <coughs> and the American Marketing Association students are back there to give you your uh, ticket, uh, your uh, drink ticket, and then we clearly, we can see that Andy is an open book and that she will be talking to you about whatever you'd like to talk to her about. And we also have Mr. and Mrs. McConnell, or her parents here, as well as Noah, her husband. They'll also talk to you and tell you a lot about what's been going on. Because clearly it's interesting between, well, you said it's related, 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 except for the grocery store. That's got to be weird, the chickens to sand conversation. So anyway, so we will continue the, the conversation in the back. And thank you very much for coming today. Look forward to seeing you again.